So I'm Flight Lieutenant Roger Cruikshank, um, and uh, you know the reason I'm here is to, um, and the reason I'm, I'm doing this is to talk about the Eurofighter Typhoon, because it's an awesome aircraft, but also to try and fight the stigma that's attached to mental health. Um, I have you know, gone through this with uh, my close family. I lost my mother to suicide, and ever since that day in, in April 2010, I've been really wanting to, to fight the stigma and get people more open about it. It was completely out of the blue um, to me and to our family, and ever since then I've discovered that there is a stigma and all we need to do is talk about it and communicate and, and various things that will go into the interview but I just want to introduce the book Speed of Sound, Sound of Mind uh, with all profits going to Health for Heroes and Scottish Association, uh, Scottish Association of Mental Health. <laughs> okay Roger, when did you first become interested in aviation? Yeah, so aviation for me um, was probably when I was young it was anything to do with that was fast and had an engine. I was intrigued by. So that's definitely how I got into it. And also my dad was uh, a big lover of World War I and World War II aircraft. And he was always you know, watching telly with World War II dogfights and things like that. And I think that's what kind of pulled me into it and, um, and gave me the, the interest at an early age. When was your first flying experience? Um, so for me, it was my sister and I. Um, went for our first uh, shot in a glider, and that was at Dinnet, which was just um, to the east of uh, Boyne Academy. Um, and we went there, and it was a bit of an introductory thing because I was always saying to my dad and my mum, oh, "I really want to want to be a pilot." You know, always always had done. So I said, "Okay, well, let's go and see how you fare in, a, in an aircraft in a glider." Um, but I remember it really well because. Um, I was very jealous when I landed, and I think after 26 minutes, something like that. And it was a really good flight, really enjoyed it. And I was like, yep, got the bug, I love flying. So, you know, straight away. And my sister was um, all the way over to Loch Nagar, went about 5,000 feet higher than me, and was airborne for about an hour 15. So, yeah, that was my, my first taste. I had a bit of an interesting beginning to my Air Force career because of my skiing. So, um, I was effectively a professional skier um, before I actually joined the Air Force. Um, so when I joined in 2001, I was actually uh, in the full-time British ski team. Um, so I had done um, you know, a, a full-time season with the team and it was going really well. Um, but then it got to the point where my parents were nearly bankrupt because of skiing. There's no real money in it. Um, and I always wanted to be a pilot. So I had this, you know, I really wanted to go for the job and, and, and go for the dream job. So, um, you know, so I committed, I had to just leave the skiing behind. But then luckily the Air Force, uh, when I got through officer training, I successfully completed that. I was about to start flying training and then they gave me the opportunity to go out to the RAF ski championships um, and then did really well there. And they said, okay, well, we want you to try and beat the army. So uh, they, they brought me along to the inter-services as part of the team. And then uh, again, luckily did really well. You know, that's what I was doing professionally before. Um, so from there, they then said, oh, well, actually, let's, um, because of this, they had delayed my flying training. Um, and then after that, the services, um, some of the, the senior officers came up to me and asked, you know, why I wasn't still continuing skiing. And I told them about, you know, what happened and, you know, we ran out of money, basically. I wasn't able to continue it, uh, but I've always wanted to do this job, so here I am. And the RAF, um, the Chief Air Staff, actually granted me a, a, a four-year sabbatical um, to then race in the Olympics. Um, so at that point, I... Um, I went into the kind of full-time British ski team, still working, and I was actually involved in organising the Lookers Air Show for about four years. Um, so that was the job I was doing when I was home, but then I was continually training with the British ski team. And then managed to uh, compete in the 2006 Olympics, and then I went into flying training um, straight after that. Um, and then started flying training um, at Witten on the Grob Tutor. Like an action man. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so what did you fly? Um, um, your basic training, and how long did you fly for? Yeah, sure. So uh, for the uh, basic training, um, so the elementary flying training at RAF Witten on the Grob Tutor, um, and that was an awesome bit of kit. You know, the, you could cartwheel the thing. Um, it was such a manoeuvrable, or is it such a manoeuvrable aircraft. Um, and now, I mean, it you know, could be done with uh, glass cockpit and all that, but to be honest, at that elementary stage, I think it's just perfect the, the way it is. So yeah, really fun aircraft to fly, and I've got fond memories of that thing. Yeah, so, uh, um, epic. Um, I absolutely love the Hawk T1, and um, I actually did five years in it, and about 750 hours on it, I think. 
Um, so I managed to get a passenger flight in the back of one about a year before I actually started uh, the training. So at that point, my dream was purely just to fly solo in a Hawk. That's all I ever wanted to do. And then of course, when I got there, then I just wanted to do more and more, and, you know, get better and better and then further. And then onto the Typhoon, you know, there's the, the, the kind of ambition grew. Um, but yeah, an, an awesome bit of kit. And it's probably worth talking about now to compare it to the Typhoon where you see you get the, the Hawk T1, which is, you know, very much like a little kit car. You know, it's very raw, you know, the braking, the controlling, you feel everything, all the buffets through the wing, the, the energy management is very obvious, the way the, the, wing, um, uh, the, the wing handles really. Um, and then you compare that to the Typhoon, which actually you're in buffet most of the time, <laughs> just because of the big Delta wing. Um, and you don't get a huge amount of feedback on the Typhoon, but then because of the huge amount of power, it makes the Typhoon an absolute beast to fly, a, a really amazing aircraft to fly, because all the information as well. You know, back to the Hawk, which has got no computers whatsoever, um, and that again is the, the beauty of it because it's such a basic aircraft you just throw the switches forward, get airborne and, um, yeah, and take it from there. Sure, so yeah, after the Hawk, because um, I did about, like I was saying, about uh, five years at RAF Alley, the magical island of dreams that is Anglesey, um, and then went on to the Eurofire Typhoon after um, luckily a successful advanced weapons training course. Um, so yeah, from there on to Typhoon, so that was in about April 2013 um, and I really I had you know, achieved that ambition of always wanting to fly a Typhoon. So even to be sitting in ground school learning all about it, I was absolutely fascinated and really excited about the adventure on the Typhoon. So that's what, what you always wanted to fly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, ever since I knew about it, I remember playing that game. EF2000, that computer game, you know, because I think when I was young, um, I remember trying to convince my dad um, to, to let me buy um, a computer or a, some console or something. He was never very keen, but then actually I think he's glad that he let me do it because, you know, the eye-hand coordination and just getting immersed in the flying world. I remember, you know, dogfighting when I was whatever age it was, you know, using these computer games. And actually that's how I got into it in the first place. <laughs> so that's what kind of set the ambition. And then just knowing all about this, this new exciting aircraft and always wanting to fly that. So when did your training on Typhoon start and how long did it take? Yeah, so it was um, April 2013 and the training itself was about, I would say about six months. Um, so you've got the initial ground school process obviously to go through and learn about all the millions of computers that are in the aircraft and um, figuring out how it all connects really. Um, and then from there going on to the, the process with the, the simulator and learning to fly the thing um, in the simulator and then before you actually obviously get airborne um, on your first solo trip. So how did you find the simulator? Yeah, awesome actually, and, and at RAF Coningsby they've got the, the full motion simulator, so the FMS, where you're effectively in a bubble, so you can actually look almost all around you, not so much over behind you, not directly behind you, um, but it gives you this um, you know, really good feel, and, and actually the most bizarre thing is if you're standing in there, you're not actually sitting and flying, but if you're standing in you have to hold on, <laughs> otherwise you will fall over because your, you know, the the visuals make you actually think that you're you're getting chucked around and and you know going inverted when actually you're just standing like this. So yeah, it's it's an impressive bit of kit. Oh, it really is. Video game. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> so what was your first trip like? Oh, it was awesome. Um, I, I remember it well. Uh, on my first one, the first two trips were uh, with um, an instructor in the back, um, and you know it was it was really. Um, so good to be flying this thing which just had so much power um, and it's nice to see the computers you know in action and, and getting that that you know having that moving map and all this information that I never had before in the Hawk T1 and and getting used to using the radar for example um, and then you know fast forward on to my first solo trip which was only you know a, a few days later and um, so it was my third trip on in the typhoon was on my own and um, I remember I had a perfectly clean jet, so nothing hanging off it, you know, no missiles, no tanks, and it was just me in, in this fighter. And um, the power, you know, the, as it blasts you down the runway, it was just something else, and um, I'll never forget that, because, you know, the Hawk T1, plenty of flying experience on that in jets and getting used to the speed, but not ever having that amount of excess power that the Typhoon has, so yeah, it was something else. So how did the Hawk, like, uh get you ready for the typhoon because obviously there's no glass cockpit did, did it 
Uh, yeah, it's, and it's a good question because it's um, with the Hawk T2, it's a bit of an easier jump, you know, to come from something that is glass cockpit and it's got all this information as well. But like you say, the Hawk T1 um, didn't have anything at all apart from a, a bolt-on GPS that you put into the top of the instrument panel, which, you know, was helpful and did the job, but um, nowhere near the Typhoon. Yeah. Um, so, it, but the Hawk T1, what was really good was getting your airmanship skills you know and just knowing how to fly without having to actually depend because you can depend on the radar too much and depend on on this um and the moving map and uh, we're actually you need to be looking out and trying to you know get your your heads around the the battle space really as you know the airspace but really thinking military wise you know the battle space and what's around you rather than just depending on what the kit is telling you so was the back of uh, the two seat typhoon was it mirrored to the front? Yeah, exactly that. Um, it's not got every switch um, that it has in the front, um, but mostly everything in the back. So, and you can fly it from the back, obviously, as well, um, quite easily, although the, the view is not very good. They've got a repeater and the head-up display, so you can actually see kind of through the camera what is being seen out the front, um, so it makes it easier to land you know, from the back, for example. Um, but it's it's not great, you know. It's not really designed for that. It's designed as a as a bit of a backup thing if the instructor needs to land when the guy in the front makes uh, <laughs> makes some mistakes. <laughs> so what was it like coming from the Hawk and then the first time putting it into reheat? Oh, just awesome. And and it's still I do now when I fly the Typhoon is go down to low level as low as I can go over the sea and come all the way back to as slow as it'll go, which is you know, it's only like 110 knots. Um, you can be lucky if you get that slow and then just kick and reheat and the thing it accelerates like being on a motorbike until you while well, you would get up to the speed of sound you know it's it really is an impressive bit of kit um, and you can just stay there and it, it really is that is the best way to show off the power and also if you're doing a performance takeoff or a, or a QRA takeoff where you want to get you know off the ground as quick as possible um, and you use max reheat I mean it's it just surprises me every time how much power there is um, and that's you know for example with the performance takeoff you go reheat and then you stick it onto its back and it's just the weirdest sensation when you're still going up and you're looking out and you're completely on your back you know it's just incredible the amount of power that is in this thing um, but still so easy to handle as well. Mm. So when was the first time you went supersonic? Um, yeah, it was probably on the, the first trip actually, um, where you get to, to really appreciate what the aircraft can do. So they try and show you the, the, you know, the different aspects of the jet. But to be honest, um, you know, it was a big event, I guess, to begin with. Um, and then the more you do it, you know, every, most times we fly, we'll go super well. Uh, it depends on what role we're doing, but if we're doing air to air fighting, then we'll go supersonic most of the time. Um, and it, you become very much, it's just a number to you, <laughs> to be honest. Still appreciate it every yeah. time. <laughs> so going back to training, what kind of missions did you actually do uh, for training sorties? Um, yeah, so to begin with, it was all about obviously learning the aircraft, but then that happens you know, very quickly and then you're moving on to um, QRA profiles, the quick reaction alert profiles. Um, so that you can be you know, used for what is the, the primary aim uh, of a typhoon defending the, the country's airspace. Uh, and then from there, um, on the course, you'll uh, have a look at um, yeah, air to air, so um, uh, defensive counter air profiles, offensive counter air profiles, and start to look at those and, and how we operate in, you know, in our main training environments for, for air to air. Uh, but of course, air to surface being very important now as well, and we're introduced to that in the, on the course on the operation conversion unit, um, where they they yeah, introduce you into it, so you get a bit of exposure, um, because very quickly as you hit the front line, then you need to be multi-role um, combat ready, so that you are able to deploy for whatever situation arises. Because um, as you know, you know these days we we are fighting all sorts around the globe, so. Sure, so you know, with the Eurofighter Typhoon, going from the Hawk T1 into this aircraft with um, all this information available to you, um, it was certainly a case of knowing where to look at the right time. So trying to not just learn the layout of the, of the cockpit, um, but all the buttons available to you as well. So on the HOTAS, the hands-off throttle and stick, which is just an epic you know, bit of kit itself, because you've almost got it's something like 50 to 60 button selections just you know on those two controls um, and with shift as well to, to give you even more and um, so you can actually do most of the flying of the aircraft just with your 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 hands remaining on the on the throttle stick 
um, as the title suggests, um, but giving you the three MHD screens as well um, to, to give you that kind of look down to, to get any bit of information. So, you know, quite often for, for me, the way I'll have the cockpit laid out is the, the uh, radar B-scope on the left, and then in the middle, I'll have my moving map, so my personal awareness screen, and then on the right, I'll have the elevation format uh, for my radar as well. So it gives you the, yeah, where they are um, in relation to the ground um, of where the radar contacts are coming through. But of course, that coupled with the head-up display but now, not to forget the HMSS as well, so the helmet mounted symbology system, which is just an epic bit of kit um, because it really um, brings everything together. You know, so for example, if you are in a close air support environment and you need to target something on the ground, um, you know, we do a lot of this for training, like I was saying. So we can just look at it with the helmet and then with one button selection, place all our symbology over that. And then it'll bring, say, the Lightning 3 pod into that as well straight away. So all you have to do is finesse it and then you can be, you know, for example, dropping a paveway four on that uh, within seconds. So it's a very um, excellent bit of kit and the way it's all synchronized now and harmonized, um, it works really well. And I think to begin with, when I came onto the aircraft, it was, it was there and it was starting, but um, we weren't getting, um, using it, you know, so much. Uh, and it wasn't so important, air to air was where it was at. Um, but now, you know, we are a hugely um, uh, confident multi-role platform um, and we're showing that across the world and we've got that reputation now as well, which is, which is excellent. So what was your first Typhoon Squadron? Uh, first Typhoon Squadron was uh, 29 Squadron for the Operation Conversion Unit, so obviously teaching it, but then straight on to 6 Squadron after that, um, which is the, yeah, the, the emblem there. So. Um, so uh, from there, uh, I've done a good three years with them, uh, Frontline, and um, yeah, uh, been all over the world with them as well, actually, which has been a fantastic experience and a, and a, a solid bunch of uh, guys and girls in that squadron. So what was the main role of Sixth Squadron? Um, I mean, the main role, to be honest, for um, any Typhoon Squadron is, is really the quick reaction alert. Um, and, and it does change, of course, depending on what comes up. Um, but we've done things like, you know, the Baltic air policing out in Estonia. Uh, we were patrolling the Baltics, um, so we, we did um, a bit of that as, as a force. Um, many exercises as well. Um, so we've been out to Red Flag. We did that as a squadron um, just the year before last. Um, and then also went with one squadron last year as well. Um, so that has been, um, you know, fantastic to go in and be such a big player in what is, you know, the biggest air-to-air. -air. In fact, it's really multi-role um, uh, mission out there now as well. So, yeah, it's been a fantastic experience. So how many hours or times a week did you fly? Um, I think on the Typhoon, it really did change on what, um, you know, what we were working up towards um, and depending on the amount of hours that we were given um, to achieve, the, you know, the task to, to go out onto whatever operation or um, detachment or exercise that we had. Um, but really it would come down to flying about two or three times a week generally um, to share out amongst all the pilots in the squadron. Um, but with one flight, even if it's, for example, just an hour and 15, um, it could be that that will actually take about five, six hours and um, because of the, you know, the end to end planning um, to make sure that we yeah, treat it as if it is a live mission every single time, you know, that it is a, a, a real time mission and um, trying to make it as realistic as possible. So how many jets were on the squadron? Um, I think on six squadron we had about um, 20 jets. Um, but of course, it would depend on the different engineering cycles, whether they were available or, or not. Um, and, you know, in every engineering squadron would, would really, um, yeah, it would depend on, on how good they got on with the aircraft and how the fleet is, is doing as well. Because they might have to take different variants because um, we've got the P1EB, which is the latest variant. And that's got the clearance for the Paveway 4 and it's, um, and it's really the, the best bit of kit that there is or the, the best um, Typhoon variant there is at the moment. Um, but that would get moved around, you know, for different operations and exercises coming up. So it would mean that, um, you know, it might get pulled off at of once. So it's not as if Six Warren had their own specific jets. They might do for a few months, but then it'll change around. Um, but I have to say that I really do feel that we have the best engineers um, in the Air Force and Six Warren. They just did a fantastic job. Um, I can say that now because I've left the squadron. <laughs> uh, but they really, you know, did a fantastic job. And it's amazing how much um, they kept the jets reliable for us. And we always, we always achieve the task, you know, without fail. So impressive.
So could you tell us what QRA is? Yeah, so Quick Reaction Alert um, is effectively us sitting around and being ready for you know 24-7 for any call out. Um, so if we have the Russians coming from the north or if we have a an airliner that is um, that is coming in from any direction and maybe not talking to anyone, then we have to make sure that we get there. It's maybe not because they are you know doing anything bad, it's but we we just really get airborne to go and help them uh, if they need assistance. Um, if they have had a complete communications failure, then actually we can be there to, to help them and, and assist them through that. Um, and there's all obviously you know various protocols to um, depending on the situation that arises with what has happened with this airliner. Um, and it's the same with the Russians. How you know quite often with other aircraft they will put in a flight plan or they'll they'll talk to someone, but they will quite often just come down because you know it is international airspace. Um, but we have to, to make sure that they're not infringing on our you know our own domestic or sovereign airspace. Um, so that's why we are sent up as well to assist them if they need it, just but just to shepherd them as well uh, around the UK mainland. So how many times have you been called off in on QRA? Um, quite a few actually, I've been uh, quite lucky, uh, was the way I view it, um, in uh, getting airborne and intercepting uh, lots of different aircraft. So I've intercepted 22 different um, Russian aircraft, so uh, I'll get this right, it was um, it's 10 bears, a blackjack, <coughs> um, a Midas, the tanker which was for the blackjack, um, four foxhounds, uh, a curl and, and then four fullbacks as well. Um, so I've been yeah quite lucky with uh, all those aircraft and all the intercepts, um, and you know experienced quite a lot of different things you know at different times. I think I've had one which was you know a nice lunchtime departure where they, they came down at kind of a, a gentlemanly like time, <laughs> and then to a half three in the morning uh, where you're kind of getting pulled out your bed and then you know getting airborne to to have to um, yeah which was quite a, an intensive uh, initial picture where there's a lot of aircraft coming down from the north. Um, so yeah, it's, but it's amazing experiences and, uh, and some of the stuff like, I'll never forget seeing the blackjack uh, through the NVGs um, later on at night or in the morning actually. And um, you know, looking through this thing and seeing this, this kind of green glowing big beast um, that I'd come up to intercept and shepherding it around to the, the west. It was actually the one that went down to uh, into the Med and then came across to, to bomb Syria on, on its way through um, with its cruise missiles. So that was a very interesting uh, time for me and to, to see that in the papers afterwards as well, what it actually got up to uh, was really interesting as well. So when that bell or siren goes, what goes through your mind? The adrenaline spikes straight away, that's for sure, every single time, whether it's training or for real, because quite often you don't actually know if it's training or yeah. if it's for real. Um, and then the first thing is just don't mess up, just keep to your training, I think. And that's what I always try and, you know, don't think too far ahead, just do what you, you're doing, do what you've been taught and, and get into aircraft and just simply worry about getting the thing ready, you know, because like any computer, like your your mobile phone, you know, quite often it just won't work. So you have to switch it off and switch it back on again. The Typhoon is very reliable and actually, you know, most times, if not, yeah, just about every time I've had a, an on-time departure, you know, with it, within our acceptable time. Um, so yeah, it is definitely a case of getting an aircraft, getting it fired up and then getting on the comms and worrying about where this aircraft actually is. So just get, get an airborne as quick as possible really is the main thing. So does all your training kick in or you're a bit nervous when it happens? Oh, d definitely a bit nervous every single time. The fear of failure is always quite a lot, you know, it's quite hard to, to fight off and it were, which is what I talk about in my book actually, sorry to selflessly uh, <laughs> pluck it there. Yeah. But, um, you know, just, it, it, and that's what, you know, we talk about in the book is the, the fear of failure and these feelings that go through and I actually talk about some specific, you know, QRA uh, scrambles where, you, you have got all these things going on. It can be early in the morning, but you just yeah stick to the training because we've done it time and time again. And you've got to rely on that and rely almost on the instinct to, to keep you safe and to keep you doing the right thing. Um, and you know, it's worked, you know, it works most times. We made mistakes along the way, of course, everyone does. I and mean, I guess we have to accept that as well. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, it's, it's always a rush, that's for sure. So do you ever train with other nations? Uh, yeah, we do actually, and quite a lot, um, which is really good. It helps us to, well, keep relations up, but also to see how other air forces are doing their business. And it means we can learn from them. I'm sure they learn from us and we can, yeah, just work together as well um, and, and come up with the best way to do business, you know, working as a team w with other nations. 
Um, so, you know, with America, for example, done a lot out in Red Flag. Um, we did a bit um, with Sweden when we went to the Alpine Challenge exercise and with Finland as well. Um, and that was, you know, really good to fight some of their aircraft and, and for example, fight against the Gripen and the F-18. And then America, um, we've uh, USAF and, yeah, we fought against F-16s, the F-15s. Um, and, you know, it, it is very interesting. And I've always wanted to, you know, see an F-16 up close or to fight one and to actually do that for real. You know, I remember I fought one of the Top Gun instructors before I did the Red Flag exercise um, last year. Um, and we never got to meet each other before. It was a telephone brief and we never got to meet each other after, but it was a hell of a fight. You know, it was, it was an amazing 1v1 kind of dogfighting experience. Um, and luckily, because the typhoon is a beast, you know, I came off well. And, but it was incredible to be flying alongside because he was the formation leader um, for the recovery. So we just arrived in the airspace, we met each other, we had a fight, and then we um, terminated that and then joined back up and he led me back into, um, into Nellis Air Force Base from there. But it was incredible to have him doing all the procedures of us joining up and me to be sitting on his wing in a typhoon with him as F-16 and just kind of, you know, giving each other thumbs up. It was just an incredible experience. And especially because I'd, you know, done quite well against him as well, then, you know, it was really good. I mean, no excuse, the, the typhoon is a beast and it's got so much excess power that it really is an amazing dogfighter, but an incredible experience. Was it one of them cool camel F-16s? Um, no, it wasn't actually, no. um, because yeah, you're right. They have those for the you know, to act as the aggressors and the aggressor squadron out there. Um, but unfortunately, not. Well, I say unfortunately not. It still looks really cool yeah. as it is. But it's really small, especially uh, compared to Typhoon. You're looking at the big Delta wing, and you look over to F-16, and it does look like. I mean, the guy was quite big. He just yeah. looked like uh, Donkey Kong in his cockpit. <laughs> you know, it was but an impressive, sure. really impressive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So how do you fare against the Gripen and F-15, for instance? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the Gripen as well is a, a quite similar um, in a way to the F-16. It's um, single engine, so it's not got you know, as much power. I mean, it's a very, very capable aircraft, but again, we've got the SCP, the specific excess power um, advantage, massive advantage compared to the weight of our aircraft. So that means that we're, not, we're, we're going to bleed off energy like any aircraft does, but actually we'll, we'll get it back up a lot quicker than a Gripen ever would, for example. Um, so, yeah, it was an excellent aircraft to fly against, and uh, some of the guys on the exercise were able to fly with them as well and get a shot at, at, um, yeah, at low level with those guys, which is a lot lower than we ever go. <laughs> um, and then, for example, the, the F-15, I have done some uh, 1v2, so I was the red air for their yeah, 2v1 profile, um, so fighting against the two F-15s, and um, that was great fun, but <clears throat> again, the Typhoon is, is you know, impressive in that um, they're trying to do the best they can to kind of you know, pincer move me and to use their 2v1 tactics, um, which we are you know, very well versed in as well. Um, but I was just a, a raging red, you know, the, the bad guy trying to flick between the two. Um, but the F-15 is such a huge aircraft that, you know, the Typhoon should outperform in BFM as well um, uh, because it is a lot more manoeuvrable. Um, but still, you know, the F-15 is a hugely capable aircraft and can carry, you know, so many armaments. Um, and it's got, um, you know, very good radar, especially when they've got the ESA as well or the, you know, the electronic version of the radar. It, um, yeah, it's a, it's a great bit of kit. So how do other nations view the Typhoon? I think we've got a fantastic reputation now, uh, and I think we've earned that through our operations throughout the world, and you know, that we're doing now and, and have done to kind of prove ourselves. But also from Red Flag, which is you know it's, it's the biggest exercise in the world, and to to have that and to to showcase our multi-role platform. Um, you know, I'll never forget when <coughs> watching a debrief, and it was. Um, it was a friend of mine, uh, one of the pilots who was um, doing a, uh, an AI mission, so an air integration mission, where he was um, dropping a Paveway 4 for real within the exercise. Um, you know, it was just on, um, on, on some target in the desert. Um, and um, so he successfully did that. But meanwhile, there was an air-to-air -air war raging on at the time. And um, he was able to successfully drop that Paveway 4 and then at the time he was listening to the picture and heard that there was a, a red, you know, uh, one of the aggressors, so one of the bad guys just about getting um, out to the east to the, to the, to the mission fail line. Um, 
But then luckily he managed to pick this up on his radar and, and fired you know, um, an AMRAM off, um, simulated obviously, and, and took this aircraft out just before it hit the line. But it just showed the, the platform, the incredible platform that Typhoon is with multi war. He was able to do that drop pay before, um, you know, for real, as in within the, the training environment. Um, but but drop a live pay before and then turn up and using the simulated you know radar was able to pick this aircraft up and um, and yeah and Fox Street before he got to that line which was just great and all the you know the Americans were like oh yeah this uh, this typhoon that's that's pretty impressive yeah so so yeah it's we've got a great reputation and, and we're building building as, as well as the typhoon progresses as well through time with software uploads and just improvements as it, as it gets more established. So how long did you spend in that red flag? Um, we were there for, I think it was about five weeks. Um, so the exercise itself, I think, was about two weeks long. Um, but then we had uh, about a week of pre-exercise flying. We were um, you know, doing things like flying with the Top Gun instructors out there um, and, and fighting against the F-16s or just doing various missions before and, and getting to know the airspace. And then we had a bit of time afterwards. And then, of course, when you bought on the, the amount of time to trail the aircraft out, to, to actually fly them with the Voyager tankers out there and back, um, then you're talking about five weeks, yeah. So what's it like tanking on a Typhoon? Is it easy? Uh, oh, it's never easy. And I don't think <laughs> anyone will ever say that it's easy. Even, you know, even if you uh, manage to not miss the basket for 10 times in a row, you just never talk about that because the next time, Saw's Law, you'll miss it completely yeah. or, or snap off your probe or something. Um, so, I mean, it is a very nice aircraft to fly, but um, because of, for example, we've obviously got the probe that comes out to, to the right. Um, and then because you've got the bow wave that comes over the front of the aircraft with the airflow, um, as soon as you get closer to the basket, then what happens is that bow wave actually pushes the basket out of the way. So you can't just like you think, you know, like if you're driving a car and if you had a metal probe on the side of your car, you could probably, mm. you know, I don't know, drive it into the back of another car. And it's the same sort of thing. But, but of course, you add in the aerodynamics where you're, you're flying about three, four hundred miles an hour. But, you know, say, yeah, you're probably going to be about 300 knots. Um, so with, yeah, with that um, and then trying to kind of add on a bit of turbulence as well. You know, I've definitely had some some missions and some interesting QRA, you know, intercepts. Because um, obviously, in, on QRA, when you're up there for about it can be about eight hours, then you want to make sure that you're getting the fuel on and you're staying above that fuel line, on top of that fuel line. Um, but we've had some what we call pressure plugs. When you get to that point, where you're getting quite low on fuel and you're you know still worrying about where the the aircraft are that you've got to go and pick up next. Um, and when you get that coupled with turbulent conditions, then it can make for some interesting, uh, interesting refueling. Um, but again, the Typhoon is awesome. It's a very nice, stable aircraft to fly. So you, you just got to take your time and make sure you don't snap that probe off. <laughs> An excellent mission that I'll never forget was when we we're doing the Baltic Air Policing out in Estonia. Um, and from Amari, where we were based, um, we got rumours through the intelligence um, that there was possibly going to be some Russian aircraft coming around and the, um, you know, it was maybe going to be a case that we had to intercept them but there wasn't a hu huge uh, amount of information um, and you know, it was just going to be having to wait and see what the, the air traffic, uh, what their radars picked up. Um, and then that was it, the buzzer went and there we are. And we, um, we, we got the scramble message, they were going to send us up. We didn't know what aircraft it was going to be, but they had an idea that there's maybe going to be fighters. Um, but we knew there was going to be a curl as well. So that was the initial one we got scrambled for, was a curl. Um, we got airborne in six minutes, which is fantastic. It was great work from the engineers uh, and my wingman as well. Uh, we got airborne um, within six minutes, wheels in the well, and then it was straight up and we're actually on the wing of the curl within 12 minutes, which is, you know, a fantastic uh, job from everyone involved. Um, and then, you know, to be waving at the guy who was uh, flying the curl was, uh, you know, fantastic. He's doing his job, we were doing ours. And, um, and then from there, we, um, we then got another order that came up uh, from our command and um, control C2 to say that there were some fighters coming as well. So we're like, oh, okay, all right. So um, this could be interesting. And it turned out it was, um, uh, we, we turned back because they were coming from the, from the east. Um, and um, we were trying to conserve fuel as well because they, they gave us some heads up that there could be other aircraft after the Foxhounds as well. 
So we're headed towards the foxhounds, um, and you know, being as as um, as fuel efficient as we could be, and getting up to heights, and just being in a in a profile we're ready. Um, so we actually ended up just doing a, a cap, so a, a combat air patrol. We were there, kind of waiting for them to come in from the east. And um, they came in, and um, it was four foxhounds, um, which was you know quite a spectacle to see, all flying in formation. Um, so in, in Echelon actually, um, so we yeah, intercepted them, did a stern uh, intercept and came along beside them and um, you know, took some photos of them as well just to properly identify them and pass that to C2, just following all our protocols really. Um, none of them really looked at us, which was quite interesting. You know, with the curl, um, uh, the guys who were flying the curl, they would always wave, you know, everyone in the cockpit would be out the window. But these guys were very much stern, you know, looking straight ahead. Um, so that was quite interesting to see. And then we, um, we then got told that there was four fullbacks coming. Um, that was the, what was, had well, we'd been given the heads up. So again, we're like looking at our fuel going, oh, well, we've been airborne for a good kind of 45 minutes now. And, um, and they were quite a while to come, but uh, it ended up that we managed to, um, yeah, to cap again and save enough fuel that we intercepted the four fullbacks as well, which was an incredible you know, experience to see these fighters airborne. Um, and same deal as well, they just looked straight ahead. Um, uh, there was no waving from them, but it was, you know, an incredible day, and we managed to escort them, you know, away from the airspace and and right down to the south. Um, so yeah, we did a, a successful, you know, job. Um, we really did complete the task, and um, with the help of command control and our engineers to, to get us airborne in time, command control to get us there, you know, and intercept properly was um, it was it was a, a very memorable mission. I'll, I'll never forget it. Really good. Finally, what's the your favorite thing about the Typhoon? Favorite thing about the Typhoon is the power, the absolute ferocious power that it has. Um, you know, I put it into context when you're you know, dog fighting or BFM, or if you're just having a bit of a jolly and you get those five minutes where you can go down to low level and um, you know and get that experience um, of the of the sheer power that it has. So yeah, it's absolutely. Um, second to that is the the way the cockpit is laid out. You know, how much information you get given in a in a fairly seamless way. It could be better, everything can be, and it's progressing, but it's, um, it's incredible when it starts to really, it, it all works in harmony and is all synchronized. It's an yeah, impressive bit kit. Definitely what inspired me about writing the book was um, the, the loss of my mother um, back in 2010. Um, she took her own life and, and from that completely, as it would, rocked my world and, and um, you know, completely changed my perspective really on on things that were important uh, and what I realized then was the stigma attached to mental health um, and the fact that you know people weren't communicating and indeed that's probably the case you know what happened with my my mom as well as and if she had had felt more comfortable to speak to people to, uh, about her own situation her own mental health then maybe she'd still be here you know today um, so it has given me that driving force um, and that driving force and people joking about how I should write a book, you know, with all the kind of the, the stories that I've got. Um, as um, you've maybe, you know, seen or we briefly discussed before, I've got nine pins in a plate in my leg um, and I've got four metal coils on my face. Uh, this from a skiing crash and then my uh, face from a mountain bike crash. And so that coupled with um, the loss of my mum and, you know, myself and my family having to cope with that loss. Then um, we've... Um, I've, I've certainly got, you know, stuff to talk about. I mean, everyone says they've got a book in them. You know, everyone said, everyone's got baggage. Uh, things have gone wrong. Um, but that's what we really talk about in the book is, um, is yeah, is, is how to overcome that. How to not just stay positive, that's almost too simple, but how to overcome adversity when, when things go wrong. Um, but on that note, I've, I've um, um, wrote the book, co-authored the book with Donald McNaughton, who's a sports psychologist. Um, and um, we actually met when I bust my leg, when I smashed up my leg and I was mandated to go and see this uh, sports psychologist. And, uh, you know, I wasn't too keen. Uh, I didn't really know, I guess, a huge uh, amount about the whole thing about psychology <clears throat> and how you could use it, you know, to, to really kind of get the, the full power of your, of your mind. Um, but actually when I met him, we got on like a house on fire um, and, you know, we had a, a lot in common and, um, and it was really nice just to see how he really did help me, you know, put a a positive spin, and it was it was just really making a way 
of, of learning how to control my thoughts and learning how to make them positive, just to drive them the way I want to drive them in, instead of letting them take control. And just putting a system to, to my thoughts as well, which in the sporting world is the way to do it. But actually you can take all those skills and take them into to anything you do in life as well. And that's what I find about psychology. It's not sports psychology, yeah, but you can take that into anything. As you discover with the book, how we've actually um, tried to create a bit of a self-help book to, to, to really help people, not just sporting people, not people interesting in, in aviation, but you know, to, to, to really give people something that they can um, really focus on and, and think about in their own lives as well. Um, but the, the primary aim of, of the book is to, to fight the stigma against mental health, just to get people talking about it, you know, just to, to make people comfortable to talk about their own mental health, about others, or to know how to help someone else as well. Um, so here I have the, the book, Speed of Sound, Sound of Mind, and um, yeah, myself and uh, Don obviously have, have brought this paper back out um, a couple of months ago. Um, so we've already sold quite a few, and if you uh, want one, uh, all the profit is going to um, to Help for Heroes and Scott Association of Mental Health. And um, we've managed to, to raise you know, a lot of money so far, which has been fantastic. Um, but if you, if you would like one, then please get in touch with me on uh, facebook.com forward slash speed of sound 2016. Um, and uh, just send me a message there um, and you, I'll, I'll give you the links to, to where to donate. Um, basically at Just Giving, we've got a, a website set up for that. Um, also though, if you've got a Kindle or want an electronic version, then just, um, just type Speed of Sound, Sound of Mind, the title of the book, into Amazon and it'll come up there. And, um, and yeah, please support us with this uh, great cause and, and just help us as a society get better at communicating. You know, simple as that. Um, we can do better and I think everyone's really starting to talk about mental health, which is the main point. It's fantastic. So how did the writing process get started? Yeah, so... Um, you know, being, being a pilot in the Air Force, we've not got much time. We're pretty busy people. So actually, it, um, it was when I went to the Falklands because <laughs> we were doing the, um, the air policing out there. Um, and I've been out a couple of times now and I had lots of time to kill, actually, because uh, there you are, you're there on call and you do, um, uh, you know, QRA shifts um, every couple of days or so. So because of that, you're actually sitting around in your rubber suit, ready to go. Um, at a moment's notice, like we are talking about before, with the QRA type stuff. Um, so actually I had a lot of time to sit down and, and write the book out. Um, so I actually managed to, to write it in a fairly short amount of time, you know, in a couple of months. Um, but then that with combining forces with Don McNaughton and, and coming up with a plan of, of how to best, um, you know, put the book out there, how to best advertise it and how best to structure it as well to make it into a self-help book um, that's going to help people but then hopefully an interesting read as well with uh, aviation, some of my stories that you've heard and uh, my skiing uh, world as well, you know, uh, some stories from the ski racing and how I managed to, to get to the Olympics, um, which trust me, I really didn't think I'd actually managed to qualify because of the broken leg. Um, uh, and then obviously uh, looking into mental health and trying, you know, I've wanted to be very open about what has happened to me and my family and how we coped uh, and what exactly um, happened with my mum. You know, I still don't have all the answers, but I talk about that and um, and try to share my experience so that others can can learn from it or it can help them through the dark times as well. You know themselves. I don't really know much about depression at all um, before um, yeah my mother took her own life, and it was you know certainly very hard hitting because. You, you're trying to understand something that is um, that is it's a it's a breadth, isn't it? It's not just a simple like oh this is this is it. You're you just have to get over it. You just have to stay positive. It's not as simple as that, and it is a very a big grey area. Um, and I you know didn't understand that time. I I think in hindsight I knew that my that my mum was struggling with some things, and there was probably some warning signs there. But then saying that you know before um, you know years before she actually took her own life we had uh, I had actually tried to push her to go and talk to someone about it um, but she was a nurse and she was for 40 odd years you know so for her it, her reply was that well how can I go and tell my you know the, the doctor that who I work with closely and have to deal with other people about you know how I'm feeling and about my my mental state my mental health um, 
And I see that's what I think is wrong with, with the society, is, um, is for her to even feel that. You know, you should, you should have a boss or anyone around you who just will welcome you to talk about your, your, your mental health if, if you are feeling isolated, lonely, depressed, you know, whatever it comes down, because it is a massive um, topic, which is it's quite hard to pinpoint. You know, it can be one extreme to the other. Um, yeah, so I think for me now, it's not as if I have any qualifications. You know, I stand here talking through experience and, and only trying to keep it simple because I think that's, you know, what is important as well. And I think the simple thing is getting people to communicate and so that us as a society, we feel more yeah, comf comfortable. It makes us more comfortable um, to talk about it, more confident. So if we have a mental health issue or if we have something that we're just not sure about, then we can just flag it up to your boss, to your you know, family, friends. And if not, if you either are not comfortable talking to anyone like that around you, then absolutely just going to get professional help. You know, the, the, the amount of organizations out there that you can just pick up the phone and have you know, a conversation with someone who might be a stranger on the other end of the line, but they're gonna have some you know, good support network structures to, to give you or to introduce you to. And I think that's um, really important. Yeah, after, um, my mom took her own life. It was, it was very hard for me to, you know, cope myself. But then, trying to look after my sisters, who are both younger than me. But I mean, to be honest, they were probably thinking the same about me, looking after me. Um, but we really had to stay, you know, close together as, as a close knit family. So I think that was the most important thing for how to cope with it. it was how to stay together as a team, and communicate because we're all having feelings. You go through all sorts of grief, which we talk about in the book actually, the, the stages of grief, and how that is very noticeable. You know, you could be angry, sad, confused, um, and, and all these things um, I definitely went through, we all went through as a family. But we're all bouncing off each other and trying to help each other. And um, what I found, which was um, fantastically uh, helpful, was my, my wife, or now wife, um, she, she uh, sent me some articles to read from the different organizations like I think it's from Sam H um, of you know how to cope with suicide because I remember at the time feeling so very isolated thinking you know this doesn't happen to anyone you know why does it happen to well to me to my family why has my mom done it in, in, in the first place and then taking that those um, feelings and reading you know what other people have gone through it really, really helped me. And I guess, like we're you know, saying before, the driving force for writing the book was that feeling that I remember, and thinking, well, feeling so very isolated, but if people can read it, it's not, it's for yeah, people maybe coping with um, times when they've lost loved ones to suicide, but it's obviously, I want to prevent that ever happening, so it's to get people thinking about the grief that people can go through, you know, the, the, the decision you're making when you're taking your own life, and, and why not to, you know, and it, um, Obviously, it's, it can never always be as simple as that, but I think it's just trying to get communication, you know, get people talking and people knowing uh, what it, um, you know, how to, yeah, to tackle this head on really is the main thing, instead of getting isolated and feeling uh, like you're, you're on your own and you've got no one else to talk to. And I think we try to, you know, talk about that in the book, keeping it positive because that's what, you know, I want to promote is, is trying to, um, to put a, a nice positive spin on this. Yeah, it's, it's a horrible topic. Um, but, you know, I think as a society, it's exciting if we make it so for our next generation that they, they feel, and, and this is something that I'm, you know, trying to find the language to talk about. And, and I mean that, so, you know, if you're, if you're a kid, you fall over, you graze your knee, you pretty much know to go and get a plaster or to ask your mom or your dad for a plaster to sort yourself out. So when it comes to mental health, why isn't it the same thing? You know, like maybe it is for some people, maybe it is the, you know, the way some parents will, will talk to their, their kid and, um, and talk them through the feelings. You know, why are you feeling this? Or what, how are you feeling? And it's, it's not as simple as, as, oh, let's, you know, have a hug and talk about our feelings. It's just trying to give kids, for example, our next generation a, a, a way, like a skill set to, to know how to deal with that. And, you know, at fear of uh, if, they, if they fail at something. We fail at, you know, at stuff all our lives, you know, and that's what kind of molds the people we are. It's the people who, who bounce back from that. You know, I failed at plenty of things, you know, especially in my fly career, um, and managed to kind of bounce back. So teaching that as a young age, I think, is really, really important, you know, um, how to deal with loneliness, you know, when, when you're a kid, and how to, to just, just get, um, you know, kids to talk about that and to teach 
and to be you know the ideal role models but to be a role model you've got to have this information yourself and you know I'm, I'm saying this now just because of my experience and and from my knowing like your your question before of not knowing anything about mental health until all of a sudden it's on top of you and, and, and this massive horrible um, you know thing happens um, with my mom taking on life and um, so that's what I'm definitely trying to drive and trying to get people um, yeah, speaking about and, uh, and feel confident to, to talk about. So what charities uh, can you recommend for people to look at or read into or go to? Yeah, so um, a really uh, popular one at the moment is Heads Together. Um, I'm sure you've seen um, yeah, Prince William um, yeah, really kind of founding that and I think that's um, uh, fantastic uh, and getting involved with that. Um, but, and as you know, for, for me, I'm promoting uh, and giving all the money to um, Help for Heroes. Um, They've got their own Hidden Wounds, which is like a subset charity. And that really talks about, um, not specifically PTSD, but it looks into that and um, you know, really supports people with that. But it's just talking about how, yeah, the, you know, there's a lot of you know, horrible injuries that have happened to soldiers, for example, you know, losing limbs and things like that. And it's very obvious now. It's very horrible what happens to them. <clears throat> But when it comes to mental health, it's quite difficult because it can be yeah, hidden and hence hidden wounds. Um, so and I really support what Help for Heroes are, are driving with that. Uh, and then Sam H, you know, um, what Sam H, the so Scott Association of Mental Health and Mind as well. Um, they're very good at getting within the community and giving that support network so that they can be there or they can have ventures as a community to, to work together and get people you know, talking and, um, and you know, helping each other out. And, and that having that support network right there. So do you think the book helped you getting over your mother's death and coping with the situation? Yeah, I think it, it, it definitely did because the, um, with me writing the book, it was very therapeutic, you know, to, to get my, my uh, feelings out there, it kind of structured and put my, my way of thinking um, onto paper. Um, but also as well because you know what a lot of people say when it comes to mental health to to give is actually is very good for your mental health you know to give to charity to help out to volunteer all sorts of ways and for me you know being so busy with the Air Force I, I've always I always liked to kind of get involved and volunteer for different things but I wouldn't have the time I hate saying that yeah. but I just wouldn't have the time so I find that this book is a perfect way you know to use the good old joys of social media to get it out there and then to um, and to have people reading the book and making it, well and, and hopefully it helping them and just being thought provoking and getting them to talk about mental health um, has, has really worked and so far it's been fantastic so yeah that's what we've gone for. So Roger do you have any hobbies? Yeah I'm a bit of a, a sporting nut so I love my cycling, I love my skiing um, and um, I'm quite into uh, like uh, playing the guitar um, yeah, so it, to be honest, all of that and aviation uh, keeps me keeps me busy. <laughs> so, do you have a favorite TV show? Um, a favorite TV show, to be honest, anything that involves aviation, again, skiing <laughs> and cycling, then I'll I'll pretty much watch. So, yeah, yeah. Do you ever get to many air shows? Um, I used to uh, when I was on the Hawk. Then actually, we get a chance to you know go for the weekends, but. Um, with the typhoon, yeah, we're all a bit kind of here, there, and ever, especially frontline, being very busy, so not much of a chance. But I'm looking forward to hopefully in 29 score and maybe get involved a bit more again. Yeah. Favorite aircraft? Favorite aircraft has got to be the Spitfire. I think it's maybe what you know gave me the 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 absolute ambition to fly when I was young, and, and maybe being surrounded by my dad watching you know the the Spitfires and the Hurricanes, World War II aircraft in action. That really. Um, um, was definitely became the, the root of my my passion for flying, um, and I just love the sound of it. I love the look of it. You know, I would love to fly in a Spitfire, but hey, you know, for anyone who's watching, you know, <laughs> pick me up. <laughs> okay, so with what aircraft wish you could have flown if I, you know, that's when I was service? Anything there? Yeah, definitely the Harrier. I think I mentioned before that uh, with the Harrier, it was such, um, you know, a uh, an intricate beast to fly, you know, with the typhoon, you kind of cheat a bit because you've got all these computers, you know, helping you along. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it is awesome and it's in different ways, but I think the Harrier would have been an absolute, um, yeah, dream to fly. Um, it would have been quite satisfying just to fly the thing in the first mm -hmm. place, yeah. Do you ever fancy being a display pilot? Yeah, d absolutely. Um, and if the, you know, the situation arises, I I'd love to have a shot. Um, I got a taste when I did the, um, the, 
uh, the Queen's Diamond Jubilee fly past. So when we did the E2R um, in the in the Hawks, um, and I was in the R, one of those, and I, I, I put it on Twitter and things like that, some yeah. of the video clips from there. Um, but doing a bit of display flying lap with um, with Gleevy, who was um, from the Reds, and he was leading the formation, and it was just incredible because <clears throat> you look at it and it was it was quite polished on the day. But I tell you what, through you know trying to get everyone in position for it in the first place and through the rehearsals because yeah. we didn't do that many rehearsals because we didn't have the time on the aircraft you know to actually do it and um, so for us to pull it off in the day that was you know it's an incredible experience and, and very satisfying as well yeah so I, yeah i'd love to have a shot so what do you get up to when you're not flying um sport yeah definitely uh, i love my uh, love my skiing and my cycling like i was saying before so I do quite a bit of ski touring in Scotland, um, so just getting the skins on the bottom skis, walking up the hills, getting away from all the crowds, and um, you know, getting into a very serene environment where you can just be there with nothing man-made around you whatsoever. I love that, um, and I'm, I'm adding to my cycling just from all the sports I was doing before, and um, you know, I do enjoy a bit of competing. You know, so I do a bit of mountain bike races and a bit of um, road bike races as well, um, just because I, I like that. I like that buzz. Yeah. Do you ever get sick of talking about aviation? Oh no, <laughs> not a chance. And um, yeah, that, that's the worst thing my wife always says about us pilots is you get us together in a room and that will be it. it. It is aviation only. Can you just tell us where, where you can find you on social media? Yeah, sure. So on um, on Twitter, you can find me at Rod Cruikshank. So Cruikshank, everyone gets this wrong. It's spelled C-R-U-I-C-K-S-H-A-N-K. -S <laughs> and then um, on uh, Facebook, we've got it's kind of the hub for the promoting the book um, and you know talking about mental health and talking about um, you know I, I tried to keep loads of videos on there as well. So that's um, facebook.com forward slash speed of sound 2016. Um, so please look me up and, um, and 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 help me you know promote the cause of mental health and, and fight the stigma. And um, we can all do it together as a society. We just need to get talking and um, and communicate properly.